hikers and adventurers lost or hurt in the wild. Researchers are developing ways for drones to come to the rescue. The work of these scientists may mean that soon, nanotechnology will be our best weapon against a disease humans have been battling for thousands of years. And will we soon no longer need canes, crutches, and walkers? They're called soft robotic exosuits, and they may change the lives of injured and disabled people. Hello, I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and you're watching Catalyst. This YouTube edition of Catalyst is brought to you by Arizona PBS and Arizona State University. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. This is Catalyst, shaping the future through science research at Arizona State University. Behind me are the Papago Buttes, sandstone hills that people like to hike and climb. This is a park space inside a major city area of about 4 million people. Yet even here, people who hike out can get hurt, lost, trapped, and sometimes even die after falling. That challenge has researchers and first responders working together to develop new tech and new tools that can make rescues faster and smarter. In a place like the Grand Canyon, the risks are far bigger. People like these folks, who will be hiking down to the bottom of the canyon, will face cliffs and steep terrain along with the stunning views. When they get out of the car, they walk up to the rim, maybe they're just joking amongst themselves, but then they see it. They see the Grand Canyon, and, you know, conversation stops and they just have to pause and kind of take it all in. It's easy to hike down, but really hard to hike back out. And if you have some sort of medical emergency, the bottom of the canyon, that's a lot of times when we'll have to go down and help them out with bringing the helicopter in for a transport. Every storm, every monsoon rain, every snowstorm almost creates a different canyon. The National Park Service says every year, they have to make over 200 search and rescue missions into the Grand Canyon. Rangers and air crews spend thousands of hours rescuing visitors. Justin, Matthew, and the rest of their team recently started using drones on these missions. They're continuing to develop their program to see if drones can respond faster and with less risk. So when someone is presumably over the edge of the canyon, instead of sending the helicopter in a low, slow mission profile with our folks on board looking for them, which can be somewhat dangerous, we can now send a drone over to do that very same mission, get us the intel to see if there is a person over there and if it's a critical situation where we need to do an emergency evacuation now or they're obviously deceased and we can kind of slow down on that body recovery of that individual. So typically, the missions we've used drones for here at Grand Canyon have been for people over the edge, whether that be accidental or suicidal in nature. And usually we'll be contacted by Southwood Patrol Rangers and they'll want a drone to see if we can just locate where the individual may be. Drones can definitely fill in this niche for us where we can put them out there and if we crash a drone, it really doesn't matter compared to crashing the helicopter, which would be a, a huge deal. The potential of these drones are not just limited to the Grand Canyon. The county sheriffs in Arizona average right around four to 500 search and rescue missions a year. That's a lot. Compared to other states, we're right in the top as far as calls for service that the sheriffs respond to. In Arizona in general, we just have such vast terrain. You know, we have deserts to 10 to 14,000 foot mountain peaks. So it goes from below zero in the winter time to 100 plus in the summertime. One of the big factors in search and rescue is time. In Arizona, depending on where you're at, time's gonna be short. If you're in the desert and it's 115 degrees out, you're really gonna want water. Drones are becoming a very integral part of search and rescue. It's a, another tool in our toolbox to help us reduce costs and then uh, cut down on the time. We have a lost child, you know, it's heat of the day with a small ground team, it's gonna take hours to search where with the UAS, it's gonna take, you know, minutes. Now they'll be able to 
deploy a drone, get an overhead view of where they're going. The big pluses too is areas that are considered risk that you don't necessarily want to put a human or a, you know, a million dollar helicopter into. You'll be able to fly a low cost drone and be able to assess those areas before you commit yourself. Most drones do not have the technology that is needed for search and rescue. And that's why Arizona State University created the Innovation Challenge as a way to develop smarter drones. 18 teams were each awarded $3,000 to design their systems. After reviews from government and industry reps, the list was narrowed down to eight. Maxwell Lombardi is one of the students at Arizona State University working on upgrading these drones. He is mainly focusing on how to use infrared cameras to find people in the desert. We figured the best way to find someone is to look for a heat signature. Whether it's really hot out, they'll stick out as being cold, or if it's really cold out, they'll stick out as being hot. So we looked into infrared cameras. So we built our entire drone around that, making sure that everything we put on the drone could either enhance or complement the camera itself. We were able to transmit back our infrared videos real time, and people were able to watch that. So when we're flying around the desert looking for someone, as long as the heat conditions are right, they'll be able to stick out really easily. One of the things that we're pushing for from the outset in all these efforts is collaboration at the lowest levels. We want to make sure that the folks that are potentially using these systems are involved in the development and demonstration of those systems. If there's a potential for them to actually utilize these at a later date, they know everything there is to know about the system. They feel a sense of ownership because they've helped design, develop, and field the system, but also that the system is designed specifically for the needs that they have. Our main concerns with drones was their longevity, how long they could stay out in the field. And then you also use cameras that have enough capability to be able to identify the difference between you know, an animal, say, and a human. At the end of the day, when it comes to these search and rescue missions, it's the passion that keeps them going. Being from a law enforcement background, you know, most of we get credited for, you know, going out and taking bad guys off the street and, you know, solving crimes. But the opportunity to be able to help people when they're in a predicament of some kind, I think that's what intrigued me the most about search and rescue. Newer, better drones might also help when natural disasters strike around the world. In 2011, I was uh, stationed in Okinawa, Japan. Got there the exact same time the tsunamis hit, so we were part of the cleanup crew. This was a perfect example of an urban operation where our drone would be perfect for. It could have gone into the reactors, searched for people, searched for hot spots. Ground crews had to move at a snail's pace, you know, door to door, house to house where our platform could have told them exactly where there was people that were alive or there were people that didn't make it and they can come back to later. Robots can do things that humans couldn't even dream of doing and they can do it with kind of precision that can't be matched. So by being able to create these robots that can go out and act essentially as 100 humans in one go, you know, we can, one, protect the lives of people going out to look for people as well as you know, find people that are lost and stranded quicker. Plants take sunlight and use that energy to make cells and sugars and grow bigger. Photosynthesis. Now we count on it to create our food and keep us fed. We still haven't completely figured out how plants manage photosynthesis and unlocking those secrets could give us not just better crops, but better fuels too. We all know about photosynthesis, like, you know, somebody says, oh, that's green, what is, the, what is the green? It's chlorophyll, they say. Well, that's basically what we try to study. We try to understand the structure of those proteins so we can start thinking about how they function as well. Just general understanding of how nature uses light energy to drive the metabolism of living organisms is super important. This is what Chris Gisrael's lab looks like on most days, but when he's studying photosynthesis, it looks like this. There is nothing wrong with your TV. The room is kept in green light to keep from damaging the photosensitive samples. Plants reflect 
green, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they look green outside. So when we only have green light, they're not being excited by any of that light. They never even access that energy. So the oxygen never gets the energy to be able to be harmful to it. Gisrael hopes to find out why photosynthetic organisms are so efficient. It has implications whether it's in biofuels or how we construct solar cells and things like that. But a little more specifically, if we can change how it is that we can collect sunlight and give that uh, technology to engineers, for example, then we can make solar cells better. Right now, the project is in the collection stage, and the researchers are analyzing plant samples grown in small beakers and large algae reactors. So we grow in huge bioreactors, algae which actually are originally isolated from a hot lake in Japan, which do the same reactions in all plants. They capture the light, they produce oxygen, and they grow. That means producing potentially food sources. And we isolate the big complexes which catalyze these reactions from the natural source and keep them intact. And then we have two ways to solve structures from these huge complexes. One is cryo-EM. Cryo-EM or cryo-electron microscopy, is a research technique that freezes a sample in very low temperatures before using a powerful electron microscope to take images of it. It is a popular method to look at materials at the atomic level because it does not damage delicate systems. The other method which we use is to make crystals out of these molecules and we put a lot of attention to the protein be active in the crystal. So we make, for example, little green crystals. They look like little, little green diamonds out of the photosystems. And when you shine light on them, you see little oxygen bubbles coming out. The scientists then look at how these crystals diffract light. Then they work backwards to calculate the structure of the photosystem. This is the first step in understanding the evolutionary marvel of photosynthesis. If we can understand how nature has tuned that process over the past three and a half billion years, then we should pretty easily be able to bring that technology to engineers and say, how can we make this work for us for the betterment of mankind? Mummies. To some people, they're a source of disgust. To others, they are objects of fascination. In 17th century Europe, they're also, believe it or not, a source of medication. It was known that healers at the time would prescribe mummy powder of some kind to you. If you had a headache, some mummy skull. If you had a stomach ache, some mummy stomach. Mix it with a little blood and you're good to go. In past centuries, mummies were not handled respectfully or kept in museums. It was popular to have people over to your home, invite them in, unwrap a mummy, and then your guests would get to take a souvenir home, whether that was an amulet or piece of jewelry that was found, and might even be a hand or a foot or a piece of the mummy. Thankfully, that culture of exploiting mummies is over. Now, museums like the Arizona Science Center want visitors to see that mummies are precious. They teach us how humans lived and died throughout history. We could learn about their way of life, about their diseases. For instance, Michael Orlovich here, he died because of tuberculosis. At that time, it was much more common in the population. Over 70% of the population in the town were infected by tuberculosis. Tuberculosis bacteria is evolving and still affects millions of people. It usually affects the lungs and spreads through coughing. Before we got advanced drug treatment for TB, it was hoped that you could help the symptoms by getting people with the disease to move to a dry climate. Now you really can't see humidity, of course, on a dry, sunny day like this one here in Arizona. Today, the humidity is very low, below 20%. Because of its warm, dry weather, Arizona became a popular destination for tuberculosis patients. The reason Sunny Slope became such a concentrated area for TB is because they were excluded from so many communities. People would come out here with their last penny to, to make it out here in hopes of regaining their health. And they literally lived on the desert floor here in Sunny Slope in a tent. Tuberculosis remains a threat today even though there have been centuries of research looking for ways to stop the disease. 
There are many reasons why we have not eliminated tuberculosis from this country or from this world. One of which is that the diagnosis itself is difficult. We cannot distinguish very easily between latent tuberculosis, which is not infectious, and active tuberculosis, which is infectious. And we can't tell of those latent cases which one of those are eventually going to become active cases. That would be tremendous. Like many bacterial infections, Tuberculosis is evolving resistance to antibiotics. Those medicines are also painful and expensive. The treatment consists of four drugs for at least two months, and then usually two drugs for at least another four months. These drugs are not easy to take, and there are many side effects. Um, it becomes really hard to use these toxic medications for so long and to keep people compliant and taking their medications every single day for so long. Current skin and blood tests for tuberculosis can't tell if an infection is active or latent. To confirm that diagnosis, doctors use x-rays and spend weeks growing cell samples from lung mucus known as sputum. Sputum samples take time time that vulnerable patients cannot afford. The current gold standard for TB diagnosis is a bacterial culture test. They have to rely on the successful isolation of a bacterial and then profile the molecular marker in it. Biologist Tony Hugh at the Biodesign Institute says we might finally defeat tuberculosis by catching it faster a lot faster. We really need a very rapid test which are highly specific to TB and uh, independent of the use of a bacterial isolation and a sputum. Instead of waiting four weeks for a bacteria sample in mucus to grow, Dr. Hughes' rapid tuberculosis test can diagnose an active infection in just four hours. The entire procedure needs uh, two and a half hour and we can finish it. And if you want to run the 100 samples, we may need four hours. And uh, so it's uh, still much shorter than the four weeks. We don't use sputum anymore, and we use a blood test that can cover both. The rapid blood test can spot tiny proteins called antigens made by the tuberculosis bacteria, even if there are only a few of them. By using the nanotechnology, and we can very sensitively profile those peptides derived from the antigen. Also, we can apply the very accurate identification of active TB infection from a latent, and we can quickly identify the patients who has the drug resistant to TB treatment. The nanoparticle applied in our technology is in the nanometer scale, and it's at the same size of a protein and the peptide we focus, so they can individually talk. So that's called a personalized. We centrifuge the, all the particles to the bottom and separate from the others and directly spot those nanoparticles on the target of a multi-mass spec. The bioengineers in Tony Hughes' lab use a tool called a mass spectrometer. It measures the microscopic differences in the size of bacteria proteins. We will transfer the, the energy from laser to the peptide you try to analyze. So make them fly, we call it ionized, and make them fly and to be detected, to be captured by the detector. By using this method, we can dramatically increase the sensitivity of the peptide detection. The faster tuberculosis test also fights drug-resistant bacteria because now doctors can better see if their patients respond to antibiotics and stop prescribing ones that are not working. It's going to totally change the landscape of the personalized TB management. The antigen level can drop to the zero within two weeks and never come back. So for, the, for those patients, you really don't need the six to nine months treatment because anti-TB anti drug is also highly toxic. The rapid tuberculosis blood test will especially help patients in the developing world where 50% of infections are not in their lungs. Those types of infections can only be diagnosed using blood tests. Although tuberculosis is not common in the United States, we are still a long way from eliminating it. There needs to be a fundamental change or a fundamental development in either the diagnosis or the treatment or the prevention like a vaccine if there's going to be any shot, in my opinion, of actually accomplishing TB elimination. Tony Hugh wants to make the rapid blood test more accessible to people in the developing world. 
He is partnering with the National Institutes of Health to create mass spectrometers that are smaller and more affordable. We're sponsored by NIH to collaborate with Purdue University. They're developing the shoebox size mass spec and integrating with our nanotechnology, we can really take the machine to the anywhere we need. Tuberculosis test technology will need to evolve faster if we're going to have a chance of beating the evolution of tuberculosis itself. The present day tuberculosis bacteria are completely different, more resistant against the antibiotics which we use. We can study the evolution of the bacteria, how the DNA and the cells, almost cells because they are pre-cell bacteria, how it developed during the time of the 200 years. Eating mummies as medicine was a terrible idea, but researching mummified germs inside human mummies turns out to be very helpful for fighting modern diseases. Science is helping us to investigate these mummies and learn the stories of those people, so those who lived hundreds, even thousands of years ago. So how did they live? What was the climate like? What diseases did they suffer from? And how can CT scans, DNA analysis, x-rays unpack those stories, help us learn a little bit more about the history of those diseases, those situations, and bring them into modern times to help us learn a little more about now? Hopefully, with a little more research, all tuberculosis bacteria will one day become nothing more than a frightening relic of the past. Hopefully, it'll be a long time before I'll need to use one of these or one of these to get around. But imagine if instead of having to use a cane or a walker, a person could get the support they need for walking and moving from something they wear. Not something clumsy or bulky, but a kind of support system that fits as closely and as invisibly as normal clothing. This is Carly Thelman. She's wearing a prototype version of soft exosuit technology. It may be a little funny looking now, but this device could be life-changing. You may have seen news stories about them. These are devices made to align with parts of the human body, and they're usually made of bulky, heavy materials. But researchers at Arizona State University's bio-inspired Mechatronics Lab are working to make exosuits better, smarter, and lighter. So what we are trying to develop is the next generation of soft wearable exosuits. We are trying to use smart textiles and smart fabrics in a way that we can interface them with a human body. We hope that we can actually help people in need regain function again, be active with their everyday life and, and, and do things that they couldn't do before. So now you're trying just to correct, as we call the kinematics and the kinetics of the body. That means we're trying to correct the joint angles. Maybe before they couldn't extend their knee to the point that it would help them take the next step, but right now we are helping them do that. So now we're not helping the muscle do its job, so we're not reducing its effort, but we are just augmenting its effort because maybe it's not there. So this is basically the soft inflatable exosuit. It's based off of a neoprene sleeve, which is a stretchy material that can go cover your legs on top of it. So what we do here is we have two actuators in the back, which are called soft inflatable actuators. What they do is when they inflate, they stiffen up and straighten out. So we use that motion to help the leg straighten out as we walk. These actuators would inflate based on the walking timing, which we get from the smart shoe sensors. Basically what the shoe sensors are, insole pads, which are silicon tubes, which are coiled up in different places in the foot. So we have one at the heel, two at the ball of the foot, and one at the toe. They take readings of the leg and give us information back into the system to tell it when to inflate or deflate on time. Essentially during stance phase, when your foot is on the ground, your joint needs a lot of support from this device. So that's when we make this exosuit very stiff by pumping a lot of air into it within a short amount of time. And then once we detect that your foot is about to leave the ground, that's when you don't really need a lot of support anymore. And rather you need a lot of freedom to rotate your knee joint. That's when we quickly take the air from the actuator so it becomes very complex. Here's how it works. When you start walking, the exosuit follows your steps and decides when to pump air in and out. Not everyone walks the same way. So the researchers use cameras to monitor those differences and make adjustments accordingly. So far, we have primarily used those cameras to provide joint kinematics, which means we put markers on our user and we actually let them walk on the treadmill as these guys did.
so we can accurately get the joint angles. If you're using it with a healthy individual, then the muscles are working in the way that they need to. You just want them to take the extra mile. So how do you fatigue them less so you can go more over time? We have seen a reduction of something like 20% in muscle activity. What that means is we're helping your muscle by 20% to do what it needs to do. For those with weaker muscles due to illness or injury, this could provide the assistance they need to get around without a walker or a cane. Even though we see some tubes and wires right now, the finished exosuits could be easy to take on the go. There is tubing that leads uh, back up to a pouch, which allows the system to be fully portable. There's also a portable pump in the system in this waist belt so you can walk around with it. The scientists of this lab look forward to the day this technology becomes widely available and part of everyday life for people who need help getting around. I would speculate that within the next five to, to 10 years, we would be able to see people wearing those. Or maybe we won't be able to see them because they're gonna be so nicely concealed with your regular clothing that you won't be able to, to actually know that they are there, but the benefits to the users will be there. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz. Thank you for watching Catalyst, our show about science. And because science always has new questions to answer, we'll be back soon with more stories. Subscribe to this channel to see more episodes of Catalyst on YouTube.